Cool, so welcome to my talk. I am Shailen. I do a lot of JavaScript work, you could say, a lot of open source projects that I've done around JavaScript. I also run the Vue.js South Africa uh, meetup back in Cape Town. I'm also one of the community leaders for Vue.js here. Um, yeah, so I do a lot of web, JavaScript, yeah. <laughs> Cool, so this, this talk is called The Service Worker, and it's basically about bringing native mobile experiences to the web. So I'd first like to give everyone just a quick overview of the actual talk. So this is the outline. So we'll first just look at the web, the past and the present, that kind of thing. Mike Geezer, the previous speaker, already gave a good talk about the web, uh, the history of the web but this is more of a different narrative that I'm trying to bring across. And then we'll look towards something called progressive web applications, which, I don't know, might be the future, might not. It's up to a lot of people to decide on that. And furthermore, we'll look at meeting the service worker, which I would say is the heart of any PWA or isn't. And we'll then look at some of the features that some PWAs have and how we can actually incorporate it into um, something. So I'll, I'll be showcasing some demos and that kind of thing. So here goes. So in the 90s, right, I wasn't even, I was born in 1999, so I wasn't even born when the web came out. But this, this, this is how I perceive the web to be, right? So when Tim Berners-Lee created the web, he, he basically saw it as a way to share static documents, just simple documents. This was a very simple kind of web. HTML, like I think 0 0.1 or something back then. So all that was happening was just sharing of plain HTML documents. Um, and also this is the time in which CSS and JavaScript was being adopted very slowly. I think the first browser actually, IE gets a lot of hate, but I think the first browser to fully support CSS was IE. And I think JavaScript was developed just a year before, or the spec came out a year before that. And in the 2000s, right, dynamic content was the rise. People wanted to make the web a bit more dynamic with blog posts and all that other kind of stuff. So the web was evolving back then. This was by some people's standards, this was considered Web 2.0 during the whole hype and uh, marketing speak by corporates. So Ajax was becoming popular. Microsoft developed the first implementation of this, uh, the XML HTTP request object in the browser, and search engines and social media like MySpace, which is, I don't think, around today, and Facebook and all these other companies like Twitter were just gaining massive traction and Google and all these other companies. And here we see a little bit of higher use of CSS and JavaScript. I think, if I'm not wrong, one of the best examples of like the first like, like ma mainstream single page application was Gmail, I think. So you'll, you'll start to see that, yeah, this was the time when CSS and JavaScript was really becoming a bit more um, there was a lot more complexity to what we were doing with, the, with these uh, languages. And then we get to the 2000s, the decade we're currently in. And here you'll notice that monetization is everywhere. Everything somehow translates to some sort of money or pushing or pulling of money throughout the internet. And we've moved away from a very simple web to what it started out with, just plain HTML documents, that kind of thing. So we're not really thinking about just standard HTML documents at this point, really. So you'll notice advertising is everywhere, data collection, there's the whole thing of the GDPR, uh, governments are trying to put restrictions on companies and all that kind of stuff, and Google is just using our data, all that other kind of stuff, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, all these kind of things are just floating around the air. And I would say we have currently the highest use of JavaScript ever. JavaScript is everywhere. People don't even, let's say, people don't even write stuff in HTML anymore. It's mostly let's go for the quickest 
framework, let's use React, Angular, Vue, whatever. So we've moved away from thinking in, in just plain HTML, I would say, or, or most upcoming developers right now are just people saying, okay, grab React, build a simple to-do app or that kind of thing. There's no real uh, basics involved. And now, this is just my opinion, but I would say the web has become less accessible, more data needed, and maybe, I would say, run by corporates to a certain degree. And this is not really the web that we envisioned, or I would say specifically Tim Berners-Lee envisioned. I think he wrote an article about the state of the web and what he thought it would be for the 30th anniversary, um, that kind of thing. Ah, sorry. So here's the real question that I want to propose. How can we make the web more accessible? Where currently about 77% of the Earth's population lives in third world countries with very basic internet connectivity. There's probably in some countries there's, there's not even a good networking solutions for stable uh, internet access. So I'd just like to ask a few questions quickly. Who here develops web applications? Okay, so that's obvious. <laughs> Why would you be here then? Uh, who here typically on a day-to-day -day basis has more than, a, they have more than, let's say 80% of the day they're connected to the internet? Stably. Okay, not yeah, okay, cool. Uh who uses frameworks? React, perhaps? Oh cool. <laughs> Didn't know the video guy uses React. That's interesting. Um <laughs> cool, so okay, React View, perhaps, Vue.js. Okay, so I'm the only one and this dude here. Yeah. Uh Angular? I hope not. Okay, cool. <laughs> Cool, so I would say that this slide here sums up a lot of my focus currently over the last year. I've really become more sensitive towards how we're pushing out applications, how, what's the size of the applications. You'll see some WordPress sites have like, if you just check out the, the resources downloaded, some of them are like 15 megabytes for a simple static site, you know? Like, what? why? It's, it just doesn't make sense to me anymore. And I'm really thinking about areas that don't really have network connectivity, like, for example, the, the company I work for, Lumkani, we build fire alarms for townships, and what I do there is basically I work on their, their web application or starting to port over their, their uh, mobile app to web, and I'm starting to look at all these things where these agents that go out and, and, and um, try to get clients or manage the clients are in these areas without really good stable data and how can we optimize things in those areas. So this is, this is what, what my focus is truly, this is I would say my passion really. And here's a potential solution, right? Progressive web, web applications. Yes, there's a lot of hype about it. People are like just spitting up service worker, pre-built service workers or there's these things where you can put your site into a URL and it'll generate this awesome service worker for you. But I would say in most cases, those packages or pre-built stuff doesn't really work and there's no real room to customize, I would say that. So has anyone heard of progressive web applications before? Okay, a lot of people. Anyone built one or started looking at building one? Cool. So you'll probably know some of this stuff. So progressive web applications are capable of working offline, receiving push notifications, caching resources, um, background syncing and background fetching. Some of these, some of these are kind of the standard stuff, really. And yeah, they sound a lot like what mobile apps already provide. So what's this? Why do we need this, right? So. I just wanted to showcase like some of the the PWAs that are currently live and used by a lot of people. 
So for example, Pinterest is a good study. They had a, a user retention rate of over 70% with their PWA versus their, their mobile app. Starbucks, the same thing. Uber's PWA was just recently released, I think, a few months back. But they are. this is more of a, a push towards areas that don't have the capabilities of just downloading the app or uh, they don't have the, the efficient resources to run the app with. I know they have Uber Lite, which I think is a wrapper around this. I think so. Um, but yeah, so all these PWAs that are popping up is meant for more of these low resource, uh, very low end smartphones and uh, all these kind of things where people don't necessarily have the data to download the application. Or they just want to see a certain part of the the URL that they, they're trying to get to. So these are some really good examples. So yeah, I'd like to first, like I'd like to show you like the Uber PWA. Anyone seen it or used it perhaps? Did you enjoy it, the experience or? Pretty good compared to the actual app. Cool. Let's see. I think I got it open. Okay. The ratio is not that great. But let's do that. Yeah, so this is the Uber PWA. It's a complete, I would say it works just the same like the app on the phone. And basically what you can do is they actually give you Chrome. I think they added this to Chrome 77 or 76 where they give you this install um, installer. Where you can click it and you can actually install it locally onto your actual device. So, okay, popped up here. Yeah. Cool. So this, this you can use, you can order an Uber from here. It does everything, fetch the GPS location, that kind of thing. So this is pretty cool and it works in, in the most optimized way. It only fetches what is needed to show the specific page. So I think, that if I remember correctly, the size is just under two megabytes for just to download the, the resources. And it does a lot of caching of, of certain stuff like um, some JavaScript files that are re running all the time or don't change that much. That kind of thing. But this one isn't capable of working offline completely. Um, yeah, so this is a good example. I use this quite often. I actually prefer it to the app now and then because it works in, in some cases a little bit better in certain situations. Um, oh, I wasn't supposed to show you that demo. <laughs> but anyway, so you see there is some, some benefit and the benefit of installing it actually makes more sense on, on smartphones instead of desktop because uh, a lot of these kind of things are targeted towards like, let's say for example, people in India or that kind of thing. And Flipkart is actually I think the biggest e-commerce company in India and most of their traffic actually comes through their PWA, not their, their actual mobile app. I think about 80% if I'm not wrong. You guys can qu correct me later. Um, so how do we build a PWA? Tip, sorry, how do we build a PWA? It's actually simpler than you think. The, it's, the concept is very simple. So I would like to just introduce you to the service worker, right? So the service worker is very simple. It's literally just a simple JavaScript file, nothing fancy, you know, whatever, uh, special extension, anything like that. It's asynchronous, it's event driven, and it's always active in the background. So, so it's basically just a JavaScript file that you install or tell the browser to install as a service worker. So it, it just installs the JavaScript file on a, on a separate thread to the actual main thread which is running your UI code and um, IO, Ajax request, all that kind of stuff. So this happens on a completely separate thread to your main thread. So it's non-blocking, all that kind of stuff. So what does the service worker do? It acts as a proxy between your web application and your network. That's all that it is. It's nothing fancy or nothing mind-blowing. It just it's it's basically a very dummy kind of file. You tell it, okay, if this network request comes in, run this event, okay, the event logs, you can do whatever you want. That's all that it does. Nothing really special. 
So after a service worker is activated, every network request will now be intercepted by the service worker. So once you have the service worker there, everything passes through it, every single network request that you do. So the only way to bypass it is to manually uninstall the service worker. Um, yeah. So let's look at actually installing a service worker file. It's pretty straightforward. That simple line is what it takes, but it obviously there's no error handling, all that kind of stuff, the use cases, whatever. But that line of code is actually what is responsible for taking that um, sw.js file, which is found on your domain's path, and actually takes that file and installs it as a service worker. The file can actually be empty, but it'll still be installed as a service worker. So it'll take any JavaScript file. You can even take a whatever jQuery file and install it as a service worker. But obviously it won't do anything. Um, so let's look a little bit at the service worker lifecycle. Sorry. <coughs> so after, once you initiate the, the installation process of the service worker, there's, there's certain events that get fired. So one of the first events, or actually the first event, is the install event. So this happens when the service worker is currently being installed, right? So if anything happens, or some error happens here, all the other events will just stop. There'll be no installation of the service worker. It'll just cancel everything, right? The next one is the activate um, event. This happens directly after the installed event. So here you can use this opportunity to clean up any previous caches that you made with your previous service work or just do something extra, whatever you want. And then after that, your service worker goes into the state of idle. And then once it's in idle, it's basically just waiting for some sort of fetch event to happen or um, action, user action event or something of that sort like fetch, push, um, sync. Those are the three events that, that actually do some sort of thing with the network. So this is something that's a bit controver controversial, but I, th I think that this makes sense. Uh, you guys can disagree or agree. So I, I think it requires a service worker, and I would say it doesn't. There's a reason for this, why, why I would say this, because a PWA, the progressive part of it, should be able to work without the service worker API. Your application should not be confined to the inner workings of how the API works. So if the browser that's running the application that uses service worker that doesn't support the service worker API or navigator.serviceworker is undefined, it should still work perfectly without it anyway. And that's something that a lot of people or a lot of uh, tutorials that I've seen don't tend to showcase or they say, okay, you need a service worker. So then there's, there's, there's this fight. So yeah. Okay. So now what? Okay, we know what a service worker does. We know how to install one. We know the life cycle of a service worker. Some of you might have known this before. We know how to listen to a life cycle events. So how can we hook into the install event, which is an add event listener, that kind of thing. So yeah, we know what makes a, a web app a PWA. Pardon? So what can, what can I do now? So how does this actually help you in, in what you're trying to do at work or some of your side projects, that kind of thing? Sorry. I did this on purpose, so it's suspenseful. <laughs> so are you ready to get your mind? <laughs> yeah. Um, I love that meme, <laughs> or, or GIF, uh, GIF, Jeff, whatever. So this is a very simple thing that you can achieve with a service worker. It's called resource caching. 
and basically we can cache our static assets or any assets that we know is required or can make the, the application run a little bit faster in some cases like if you have massive like two gig uh, not two gig JavaScript files well that's a, that's a bit insane but like two meg JavaScript files <laughs> So here's a simple like diagram of like what's actually happening. Like let's say we have this really important uh, JS file. It actually said um, important dash JS dot JS, but this function that we created is like the most important thing our application needs, and we never want it to be non not available for our application at whatever time. So we can basically intercept or tell the service worker, okay, on installation. Here's a, a group of files. Take that files and actually add it to a cache so that we can keep that files on hand for any any point in time, right? And here you'll see that there's the cache API. This is a, a implemented API that's available in most browsers at this point in time. So here's a, here's a simple example. I um, actually should have put this full screen. Sorry. Yeah, is that better? So here we have a simple example of using the install event to actually open up a caches uh, or a cache called assets. And once that cache is successfully opened, we can actually say, go to this, I'm pointing at the screen, go to this uh, URL and actually take that file and store it in the cache. Simple, right? So this is this technique is called pre-caching. So we're caching, not dynamic caching, but ahead of time caching. And what we're doing next is we're saying on a fetch event, check, open the assets cache and actually check, okay, does that file actually exist in the cache? If it does, okay, respond back with it. But if there's an error, just continue to the network and just get the file from the network if it is there. And if it isn't there, that's not, that's not your problem. You, you tried your best. So this... <laughs> So this is called this. This is a, a caching strategy called cache first strategy, because you're looking at the cache first, and then if it doesn't exist there, okay, you go fetch it from the network. Then you get the opposite. You get network first, and you get a whole bunch of other caching caching strategies. Um, was this the time for the demo? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Let's ah. Uh. Cool, so I did a little demo here to showcase some of my, my uh, not obsession, but interest in, in doing caching or fetching caching with, or using caching to, to um, work with different bandwidths, right? Or different network types. So this is, okay, it's a bit too big, but here's something cool, right? Um, is this running locally? Okay, yeah, it's there. <laughs> cool, so I built this demo that basically showcases like how can you get resources depending on different network conditions. Let's say, okay, you want to build an experience for a user that, that's currently on 4G, or you want to build an experience for 3G users, 2G users, and maybe even offline if any of those states occur, right? So this application that I built just showcases, okay, uh, showcases like the different states in which you can do this kind of stuff. So if I re if I refresh, it'll say, okay, you are on a good network. You can still load images. So everything that I'm fetching currently in this state is all from the network. So nothing is being pulled from cache. And then you can see if I try to simulate um, fast 3G, which is just 3G. I don't know, yeah. Let's hope it works. Okay, cool. So now you see what's happening here. I'm simulating a 3G network, and instead it actually shows me something else. It shows me, okay, you're on a 3G network, and it says, it says your, your network is okay for now, and you can still load images. So it's still fetching everything from the network at this point. But let's say we go a little bit slower, and we actually go to slow 3G. Don't know why they just they should have just called it 2G, but anyway. Nobody likes 2G, I guess. Okay, obviously, 
Now it's showing something a bit different. It's saying, okay, network. <laughs> You're a 2G network. But anyway, okay, now, now it's showing that I'm on a 2G network and it says, okay, you might want to switch, switch to Wi-Fi, right? So what's interesting here is that everything else is the 2G uh, page. Okay, let me just take it back. Okay, so the 2G image that you're seeing is actually being pulled from cache. So everything else is still being fetched from the network, but just the 2G image is being pulled from cache because images are quite big, video is quite big. So let's rather optimize that or rather instead show some kind of placeholder, whatever, right? Now let's take a little bit further and actually go completely offline, right? So what you should see here is, okay, obviously you are currently offline. Now it's saying you might want to connect to a Wi-Fi network. You can't do any IO or network requests. So this is being served up completely from the cache. So let me show you the actual code. Is it too big, the code? Or is the screen size it's fine? Cool, so you can see there I'm just saying I'm doing some pre-caching in the install event. I'm just saying cache offline.html and offline.jpg so that in case of offline um, con not connectivity and non-connectivity, it'll serve up those files. So we're doing it ahead of the time. So just in case, and I'm just showing, okay, activate obviously goes off and here we have a fetch event. So what I'm doing now is I'm intercepting the actual network request for a specific file and I'm serving it something else instead. So I'm doing some interception here and not many people actually know of the connection API, which actually shows or gives you information on the specific connection that you currently have. Super amazing, super powerful, and it's actually super well supported on mobile devices because, yeah, mobile network makes sense. So yeah, I can actually check what is the effective type that the connection API is actually giving me. So I can actually check if it's 3G, 2G, all that kind of stuff. And I can match up documents. So I'm saying, okay, F3G, if um, destination is not document, okay, fetch that or respond with the actual 3G layout page that you guys saw. And the same thing goes for 2G, but instead I'm actually looking at images and I actually just want to intercept those and rather respond back with a different image or maybe a optimized image. So you can think of like, you can have different your, um, different paths. So you can say that these are your 2G resources after that path or something of that sort or 3G or anything of that kind. And here we get into, if it's not 3G or 2G, it's probably 4G. So what we do is we just do a standard network request. Okay, if it fails, then something's up, we're probably offline then what we do here instead is just serve up the offline stuff. You see it's just if statements, but it, if you want to actually build a proper application, it gets a little bit more complex. Yeah. Um, cool. So, yeah, that's the, that's the actual code. It's all open. All the, the um, source code for all the demos I'm, I've done is all on GitHub. You guys can play with it if you want to. Um, what did I do here now? Okay, what's next? Let's go next, yeah. Cool, so next. So caching is a very normal, I would say, or very simple idea to do with a service worker. We've been doing browser cache for a while with headers on requests and that kind of stuff. But with this cache, you can, you can do just about anything. It gives you the freedom of implementing whatever you want. And then this is probably one of my favorites, something called background sync. Anybody used it before? Anyone? Okay, cool. So it's something new. <laughs> so background sync is, is something really, really powerful, I have to say. It's, so basically what we can do with background sync is we can actually queue our Ajax when offline. So 
we can submit a background sync task to the service worker and we'll actually queue our fetch event, keep it in a, in a, a pending state, and then actually wait until the network is back up. So here's a diagram. Submit an AJAX to the service worker. Service worker obviously has the code for handling that thing. We submit the, serv the AJAX to the background sync API, and then you'll see if it's online, it'll just go straight through to the REST API and save your data or whatever, post data. And then if it's offline, it'll wait until it's online. You can set like a uh, timeout or whatever you want. And then once it's back online, it'll just hit the API and post your data. So this is one of the, the coolest, I would say it's probably one of my favorite stuff about using service workers. And I actually built a demo. Uh, it might be a bit tricky to do. Let's see. Okay, is it up? Mm. Ah, yeah. I know what to do now. Just spin up a terminal here quickly. Cool. Just give me a second. Yeah, <laughs> very basic. Uh, no styling, just a simple <laughs> input field. Um, yeah, BS demo. That's not a swear word, by the way. Just give me a second. Okay, cool. Just open up the the console. Network application. Okay, yeah, almost ready. Cool. So yeah, in DevTools, they actually added this pretty recently, background sync and background fetch tabs in your applications for uh, DevTools. So you can actually check out the logs for your background sync tasks, all that kind of stuff. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to just type something. Let's just say Linux. Con F 2019, ah, not 2018. And what you expect to see is, so I built a simple node API that's just listening or waiting for the, the, the post and we'll just log that data out to the terminal. So what you should see is something should pop up, I hope. <laughs> okay, cool. What we expected is, okay, we received some data object or uh, name and you'll see that it logs something here like register, dispatch and sync complete, right? But now let's take this a little bit more to what it's meant to do. So let's actually, I'm going to do something that might be a bit scary to some people. You guys can't see it but it's actually on my laptop. The I'm switching off the Wi-Fi for my laptop. <laughs> So let's see what happens. Turn off. Yeah, turn off. And what should happen is, just going to clear this up. Let's call this Linux offline. Linux gone offline. And what I hope should happen is, if I submit, let's see. Okay, cool. You notice that there's no three steps, right? It just shows registered. Network is offline, it queues the background task, and it's just waiting for the network to come back on. I wish I can actually show you guys, like, I'm switching on the actual Wi-Fi now. I'm not doing something funny on the side. So I'm going to switch it on quickly. And if you just keep looking at the terminal, you should expect something to happen, right? Let's see. Uh, come on. Cool. It goes through. As soon as I connect to the, the Wi-Fi, it checks if the internet is available. If internet's available, it goes through, right? But let's take this a little bit further, right? How can we get a little bit further than this? <laughs> let's call this offline further, right? Yeah. But I'm going to switch off my Wi-Fi again. I don't think I saw the cards here. Turn off. I'm going to submit this, and this might even be a bit more scarier. 
submit. Now this is, imagine like somebody went through like a long form on like ABSA or whatever, and like they want to submit, and then from nowhere, sorry, network connection, bad. Your, your entire user experience just died with, with that moment, right? You're probably going to close your account with ABSA and just move to FNB or something. So I register the event, right? But now what's going to happen is I'm going to close this tab. OK, it's closed, right? Apparently, it's closed. Or oh, it is actually closed. The, um, the instance of the tab is actually dead, right? But or maybe I just moved it onto the screen. You guys don't know. You can come check. It's fine. <laughs> and I, what I'm going to do again now is I'm going to turn the Wi-Fi on. Let's see. There you go. So this is like, for me, this, is, this opens up, I can't swear, but it opens up a lot of possibilities. So imagine you're uploading form data or even maybe video data, which you can just store in IndexedDB, a large, um, like a web NoSQL kind of database, store this blob data, and then later on push it out. So you can do some pretty amazing stuff with this, right? So, yeah. Where was I going back to? Yeah. Cool. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Any questions? Cool, man. Would you be able to do something like... Uh, <coughs> thanks. Would you be able to do something like um, use a service worker to see if your server is down and then maybe intelligently say, let's try this again in half an hour, huh. right? Without the user really having to do anything about that. So the user has connectivity, but your server's down because somebody did a bad deploy. Um, to just kind of catch that error and say, cool, you know what, synchronize this with background sync, try it again in half an hour. And then you should probably like not retry it infinitely, but would you be able to do something like that? Yeah. So you can run a set timeout or pull the, the server, what you want, or anything. You can run that in the actual service worker file, and that code will always be running in the background. So you can pull the, the server and check the status. And obviously, if the status is what you want, you can just maybe keep that variable or the state of it. But I thought that service workers don't necessarily always run in the background. So like if I'm on a mobile device and I close that tab, it's not just going to forever keep running yeah. the service worker. It yeah. periodically does something. So set timeouts are tricky. Oh, yes, you're right. You're right. That's why I'm thinking with the background sync API, maybe yeah. you could use that as an intelligent way to mm. do exactly that. So there is, there is, this, there is this API that that's currently in proposal that I'm pretty interested in. And it's at the background tasks API, which you can actually run a task continuously in the background. And that's something that mobile has obviously had for a long time. And that's something I think that would help a lot more. But I think currently the server, service work is, very, not lim is limited to that kind of thing because it's still in an in a early stage of development, I would say. Does that perhaps give you... That gives me a good idea. Good idea. Yeah. Of, but I, I, we can always like I can always share that kind of info and when it'll be proposed and released or standardized, which is not too far away actually, hmm. and that's something I'm waiting for. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thanks. That was a great talk. Cool. Um, you mentioned earlier that a program should be able to run. Uh, without the service worker, um, but is that a good design principle, which yeah, I'm inclined to agree with, or is there actual technical limitations which mean that, I don't know, somehow the, the service worker, there, there's no guarantee that it's actually going to be running? Um, interesting. So that's, that's the thing about the whole PWA thing. It's very, it, it's about progressive enhancement, right? So the way, the way that I see it is that, let's say that, for example, you get some users that maybe have phones that are maybe five years old still, or 10 years old, they don't necessarily have the service worker API, but you still want to cater for those specific people with these backwards devices, like for example, 
uh, JavaScript frameworks tend to support like IE 11, IE 10, somewhere around there. So there's that whole progressiveness of also the framework itself. But also you want to be able to take advantage of the APIs that are available on the device. So if it's available, yeah, install the service worker, start caching the fonts because uh, it's, it's actually pretty cool to cache fonts and just serve that up from the cache instead of doing it from the CDN every time or that kind of thing. So there's this, there's this um, balance on like, that's the reason why I said, do all PWAs need a service worker? I would say yes and no because it's, it's not really a yes or no answer. It's, okay, is it there? Okay, take advantage. Is it not? Okay, it still work as normal as possible. So you'll see with the, PW, with the Uber PWA, it's interesting because the geolocation is not a tied-in feature. If you run that, that PWA on a device that's maybe, that doesn't have the, the geolocation API, you can still type in your address. So that's also progressive about it is that they're just like, okay, let's rather screw everyone. If they, if they only have the geolo geolocation API, it'll only work on their device. So that's the whole thing also about progressiveness with that kind of application. Uh, Gordon, does that answer your question perhaps or gives you a bit more of an overview? Cool, anyone else perhaps? Cool. That's, that's actually something I forgot to mention, which is pretty interesting. I, iOS, iPhones, when the first iPhone actually came out, guess who actually came up with the idea of a service worker? Apple. Because <laughs> their idea for the first iPhone was to run applications, but progressive applications, as normal apps on the iPhone. But then they were like, wait, we can charge devs like whatever, three grand to just put the app in the, in the app store and create a walled garden, garden and in, that's how they make a lot of money. So with the progressiveness, it's free. It's like, just do what you want. But how is their support now? Because initially they were lacking. It's actually pretty decent now, but some stuff is not really that amazing, but you can install um, PWAs now on Mac OS and that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, just, yeah, it's okay. 